plus this, you know, insane ecclesiastical, you know, um, um, super soldier wearing, you know, a fortress of armor on himself. And the reason why the proportions are like that, and I realize this by just flipping through all these paintings from the 80s, um, which is, you know, um, when, when, when Space Marines were first, when this game first launched, um, you know, we had the really awkward sort of avocado-shaped people from, um, avocado um, armored Space Marines from Rogue Trader, but moving past that, uh, they were yeah, just like that, yeah. dudes in really thin suits. Like they would have like name patches, it's like Smith and Jones on them and stuff like that. And he's even more just sort of, you know, oh, I enlisted and now they trained me up and now I'm a Space Marine. And he's even more of that really, really, you know, dumb, typical, you know, like Robert Heinlein, not that Heinlein's stupid, but I mean, just really sort of bland, um, a 40K stuff. Um, but then I realized that, you know, that's why the, pri the current Primaris Marines look the way they do is because they're just sticking with that original decision, which mm. is you're, they're going to have the silly ecclesiastical craziness and wearing a suit of armor, plus whatever the modern military stuff looks like. That's why you have, you know, the tamer, like, sort of motorcycle-looking helmet on the Primaris Marines. That's why the call pattern bolter has those rails and the bolt pistol, um, whatever the, the Primaris version of the bolt pistol is called. I'm blanking on it. Do they even have a special one? I no. Think, they, I didn't think so. Yeah, uh, it's just... They, well, the... The, um, the Reavers. The Reavers had, don't think have a new one, but... Uh, gotcha. I know there's the heavy bolt pistol. There's a heavy bolt pistol, but also right. the uh, the apothecary actually has a new Oh, uh, yeah. Pistol, which right, right, right. And I think also the um, chaplain. Um, anyway, they they look you know they just look more like Glocks and stuff like that. And um, and then I, I you know I I was disappointed, and then I realized wow they're just recommitting to their decision in the '80s, sort of for better or for worse. Which is why something like the um, well the um, um, the repulsor, the hover tank, the only transport that the Primaris get. Mm. That's actually not a very good example because that's straight out of the '80s. Like that's why that thing looks as fugly as it does, and just has a straight out of again Call of Duty, <laughs> um, you know, minigun on the top. You know, like I and I think so. I I still don't care for the aesthetics really, but um, you know, I'm I'm no longer mad about the art direction because I realize that that's the um, the decision they made. And what got me off on on this path um, in the first place, which is John saying we can forgive actually a lot of the stuff they do because 40k has always been crazy. 40k has always been crazy. Yeah. You know, they're going to do stuff, shoehorn the stuff in, just like no. The giant epic apocalyptic battles weren't big enough. There's a bigger one. So we have this new craziness going in. But here's the thing. That rationale um, that rationale applies differently because 40K has never been bigger and more popular. So, yes, that's, you know, plenty of people will say that that is the way 40K has always been. That's the way Games Workshop has always done stuff. This game is not what it was in the 80s, you know, um, in terms of not just play, but in terms of scope. Mm. Um, so, so you know, rollouts like that, I don't think are viable anymore. I'm, you know, I'm just as offended as John. And also because they're they're taking this route of escalation, uh, but like th they're trying to. The, the thing about 40k that really is kind of uh, the driving the narrative was that it was always kind of a civil war thing. It was always brother versus brother, Primarch versus Primarch, Space Marine versus Space Marine, Guardsman versus Guardsman. It was always this thing where it's they're fighting each other over ideology. Mm -hmm. And uh, granted, some of the ideology is a lot more psychotic than the others, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's not, I mean, not to say that it's, one's right or what's wrong but you they, they both have valid points the the uh, imperium for all of its touted uh wanting to be you know the model of the empire and humanity for the sake of humanity is also a stagnant pool it really it hasn't advanced in fact it has regressed over the past 10,000 years whereas the forces of chaos they're the ones who are innovating and doing what they can to push forward but they're also completely out of control yeah you know they 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 indulge in every passion every little whim of theirs mm -hmm. which is not stable so neither one of them has got it completely right but that's why they make such great en enemies right so the whole signature maledictum, I don't mind, sure. because I yeah, think it's fascinating. That's, yeah, it's it's fascinating, right. but it also it's it's a logical it's progression. Exactly, because it's established, like it's part of our mythology, which is that you know uh, so much of of everything that we're talking about in the most general sense, like just space travel 
and time travel and where did the this thing came out of nowhere no it didn't where did it come from that's been our rationale since the 80s which is you know warp storms and stuff like that we've had the mother of all storms we've had our perfect warp storm um you know i totally believe that you know that's something we have it, it's the same thing since 1983 just on a greater scale we've just never seen a storm like this yeah so i mean that i'm fine with that i'm fine with abaddon finally succeeding in destroying chaos because quite frankly he's tried 13 times already he's gonna succeed eventually i don't know eventually i feel like yeah i, I mean yeah, the, the the fact of the matter is if you keep the uh w with the f way the warp is he can produce almost infinite resources almost mm -hmm. and so if you hit something hard enough often enough eventually it'll break i feel like that they could have written off and postponed it forever postponed they, forever they could have postponed it forever but i mean having him succeed this one time is actually i mean the the fact of the matter is he's got a, he has a really poor we all we the fact of the matter is he's got the nickname fail but on for a reason he's never succeeded he's never but the fact that he finally succeeds it actually should have happened earlier, in my opinion. He should have done more stuff where he's actually shown to be a credible threat earlier, because otherwise we don't laugh at him. Because if we, I mean, if if he sh has in the past proven himself to be an actual threat to the galaxy and has been only thwarted by the skin of his te skin of our, of the teeth of the Imperials, or you know, they succeeded, but it was a ferric victory, and they, mm -hmm. they don't make much of that. It's just like no, he keeps failing. Okay, if he keeps failing, we're not going to take him seriously when he shows his face. And that's exactly what happened. Although, you know, fail but done the harmless, fail but done the armless, because his model kept falling apart. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, his stats are amazing, but uh, for uh, from a lore perspective, the, the guy has kind of no teeth. So for him to finally succeed, I'm like, it's a little too late, but uh, better late than never, maybe. So again, for him to finally succeed in destroying Katie, I have no problem with. Because finally, hey, yeah, this guy who we said is a threat, finally showing that he's a th actually a threat, that he's actually doing stuff. Yeah. You know, it, it makes sense to have that. and Because uh, if we don't fear anything that shows up then why should we worry you that's know that's a good point and i'm really glad you said that because that totally recontextualizes um armageddon you know that's the other planet that um abaddon's been going after um since the 80s basically um so that definitely you know Has he? i don't know if since the 80s but um armageddon yeah i, I mean i know that um no angron was there twice yes uh, but not not like not like cadia um Abaddon wasn't going after Armageddon like Cadia, but um, he was. Yeah, Ooh. no, that's that's the cover of one of the Codex um, Armageddon books. Is um, um, is uh, Abaddon sinking his lightning claw talons mm. into Armageddon? I so now that, that he's taken now that he's taken Cadia, that definitely is a really wonderful rationale for why it is Armageddon's relevant um, to 40k today. Well, it's also because uh, it is literally the one planet that is right on the one the most stable warp route into. Terra. So yeah. if you get past Armageddon, you're going straight to Terra. That's an important blob of dirt in space. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, and um, don't forget, you know, th that's the original homeworld of the, the orcs, which is why they fight over constantly. It used to be Ulanor. So. I was gonna say. Yeah. It was originally. Uh, originally, before it was. Uh, Armageddon. It was the the Armageddon was actually Ulanor, which was the where the War of the Beast was fought, and then uh, it was later, if I remember correctly, it was moved. So what was moved? The the planet. The yeah. basically the the Adeptus Mechanicus managed to use some of the orc tech to teleport the planet, uh, and. Um, and got it, managed to get it into a new system, and then it became. They just renamed it Armageddon and made it into a, a, a world that they were using to basically uh, as a manufacturing arm district. Uh, so it became sort of a munition. It wasn't quite a forge world, but it was uh, a place where they would raise regiments for the for the Imperial Guard, and they would use it to make uh, much needed products for 
the Imperium. It was right there on the stable highway to Terra, so it was a major important world for those reasons. And it became more important. And, and um, also for the Mechanicus, it was important because they were using it as basically a research station trying to figure out how all this orc tech worked uh, before it failed on them. Yeah. And they, and they start to realize, like, well, we can't make it work anymore because there are no more orcs, so, oh, well. But we have a world that we can actually exploit for other reasons now, so well, why not? Mm. Uh, you know, produce from Prometheum amongst other resources, so why not? Uh, and until Abaddon actually showed up, it wasn't really much of anything. So then we had, then he did show up. He just basically dropped out of the warp and started raising hell, literally and figuratively. Yeah, I was going to say. Uh, <laughs> and so that's when it was first garrisoned by, really started to be garrisoned by the uh, the IG. Mm -hmm. And then uh, later we had the second war of Armageddon with Gazgul, which was basically just his warm up round. Mm hmm. First time he encountered Yarrick, who was the only one who gave him a decent fight, and really that that planet was really lost just because of the incom the incompetence of von Straub. Mm. So, oh yeah, so really incompetence and treachery. In incompetence and yeah, it, it's probably more treachery than incompetence to be fair. To be absolutely fair on this one, because considering that he showed up with the orcs the second time around, yeah, um, he might yeah. have he might have had. He might have been bought beforehand. Some, oh yeah. Something. So uh, I remember one of my is one of my favorite favorite lines in uh, in, in every bit of forty k lore I've ever read, which is that um, Von Strapp was was found um, with his brother's corpse, um, and uh, his brother's corpse uh, had uh, over thirty rounds of of uh, bolter bolter holes in, but thirty bolter rounds in him, and and Von Strapp was holding holding a smoking bolt pistol, and then all of the all of the um, um, coroners on the planet pronounced it the most severe case of suicide they'd ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Someone was paid off. Someone. A lot of someones must have been paid off. Was paying off a lot of someones, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, Armageddon really was only in trouble only in trouble because of him. Uh, and was only really saved because of, of Yarrick. Uh, and then mm -hmm. uh, second time around, you know, Gosgul came back and uh, basically because he's, he told Yarek, hey, I'm coming back, so be ready for me. <laughs> Give me a proper fight this time. And then the season of he was there, they had this whole war for him again, and then Gosgul left because he got bored. The season of fire hit, he couldn't really do much of anything, so he's like, okay, I'm out of here. Uh, and um, he just went off and then basically blinked off into another sector, sector of space to raise yet another wa uh he'll do that while the the remaining the remaining the remainders of his current wa were still on armageddon fighting the ig forces and imperial forces that were all still there uh and then the secretary's maledictum half happened and guess who took who, who came back angron with uh, <laughs> with uh, was it? It wasn't Fulgrim. No, it was um, Magnus. Uh, Ma Magnus the Red mm -hmm. showed up, and the two of them basically fought over the planet to the yeah. point where even the orcs were looking at the Imperials, going, "Okay, you know what? That's a bigger problem than you are. So let's go ahead and kick that ass before we go back to kicking each other's asses here." Mm -hmm. Did they ever team up? collaborate anything yes. like that Ellie? that sounds nuts yeah the to the to the things got so bad on armageddon that the orcs and the imperials were like okay we're not fighting each other now we're fighting just the chaos mm -hmm. demons over there that's a very smart thing for an orc to do or for for the orcs to do yeah yeah i mean just because they're like hey we want this fight to finish you know we, we had a good scrap going and now these other guys are coming here messing up our scrap yeah. Get off my lawn kind of thing. <laughs> so. Uh, Blast my lawn green and then tell them to get off of it. Anyways, but yeah, that so that happened. Uh, it's one of the few things in, in the latest lore series that I'm actually approving of. Yeah. But the things like the return of, the way they handled the return of Gilliman made no sense. And again. Yeah. Uh, he was frozen. The time was right. He woke up. No, he was Man. dead. 
he was dead, and it was it was if it wasn't for the fact that you had they literally had an avatar of death right there to r- bring him back to life. That's meaningfully the same as he was frozen in the tube, and they, he woke up. He knew he came back to us. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's obnoxious. So Eldar shenanigans once yeah. again. The Eldar, are the major force in the galaxy, or at least the major force of change. Yeah, yeah that's true. So, um, they got so good in Gathering Storm, and they're just, they're almost like, that's the first thing I asked a friend of mine, a friend of ours who plays literally every army but Tyranids. Um, I, I just asked him, I was like, so are, are the Eldar anywhere near as good as, and he just snapped up and just said, yeah, they're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> Is that Ben? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not, not, um, Mint Potion Ben, but we have, we have, uh, we have a lot of Bens. Um, yeah. Ben, Ben, Bennett. Ben, 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 Benjamin. Ben, and Bennett. Yeah. We'll either call them or give them nicknames. Mm. We leave it up to you. Put it in the chat. What you want us to do? So, um, but yeah, the um, so we had uh, so I, yeah, Ben he he would definitely have that opinion. But yeah, oh yeah. But besides um, Gilliman and just the whole situation of his return, that made no sense. The return of um, the return or the introduction of the Primaris Marines that made no sense. Um. And it has this really rushed quality to it, which I think actually, oh, yeah. which I think actually is in fact what happened, because yeah, the rumor mill oh is the rumor mill is that eighth edition was actually slated to come out a lot later than it actually did, but they had to hurry it out the door because everyone was unsatisfied with seventh edition. Totally. So not even yeah, it was it was it wasn't even like the first half of seventh edition. I was like, this is the best Warhammer's ever been, but the way they started handling. How often they were rolling out data sheets and supplements and expansions and codex, and the way the the incredible cl- rate, high rate, uh, which they were rolling stuff out meant that you had to spend so much money on just books, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and the power creep has been power creep for each faction has always been one of this game's biggest problems. I understand. We are all um, game developers here at the studio. Um, I understand that that's that's endemic to that genre, to, yeah, to that genre of game. Um, but um, well, to any war game, exactly. genre, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but at the same time, um, the way they were handling just publishing and distributing books was compounding that. They were having they had done a lot to fix that since you know like the '90s. Going back to when I was saying they would release a big rule book every eight years. If your army sucked, you didn't wait. You know. Um, eighteen mo- a year to eighteen months to get some kind of codex update. You had to wait the full eight years, you know, and it would take you know the four you know most of the life cycle of the main rule book just to get your updated book. So you know when I say there were people playing with stuff almost ten years old, um, they were you know so that was the you know they they came back to that type of problem, um, but really really accelerated, and then they tried to fix it by releasing more stuff. So that was my big unsatisfaction dissatisfaction. And in my experience, running games, um, I don't I don't just work here at um, at Min Potion. I also um, that's actually what I was doing before I got my you know um, my first ever paying job was donate, and I still do it. Is I donate my time at uh, John and I's friendly local game store and um, uh, teach pe- teaching people how to play 40k and running events and stuff like that. So I, I meet you know a metric ton of people who you know have opinions about these games and have been playing much longer than I have. Um, ooh. Hello, Alex EDM. Hey, ooh, I believe, yeah, you were with us the last time we had our stream. Mm-hmm. Super cool. Good to see you again, my friend. Um, Vio, just talking about um, 7th edition and how 8th edition was rushed out because of people's dissatisfaction with it, um, as John framed it. And then I think that it's not the dissatisfaction with 7th edition in general, but dissatisfaction with the way that uh, Games Workshop started handling um, just all of the media right. that they were coming out with. Yeah, I can, I can kind of buy that. Um, so, but, uh, the, uh, the release of 8th edition, you know, really streamed on a lot of things, but the lore was only half-baked, so. Oh, no. That's generous, that's too generous. The lore was, the lore was literally utilitarian expansions and stuff that people, people that were most popular. Just like, alright, what's cool and what's selling? Okay, um, Ultramarines, always, literally, for as long as this game's been around? Cool! And what else is selling? Um, Adeptus Mechanica stuff. Okay, cool. Let's make a guy who wears a cowl and call him Call. Um, and, uh, it was not well handled. I have no idea what you guys are talking about, but have you guys listened to any Rhythm lately? No. No, I have not. We have not. If you are not the person who tuned into our show last time, 
then I apologize for getting you wrong. I know I've seen you around before, Alex EDM, uh, but it might have been one of our, our um, gaming tournaments. Um, it was either, I think, the Smash Brothers tournament I saw you around, um, but it might have been our last show. Um, we are talking about um, the tabletop game Warhammer 40,000. Um, um, but yeah, Warhammer 40,000. Um, but no, we've not listened. I've not listened to any rhythm lately. Have you? Hmm. Gotcha. I'm going to go out on the furthest, brambliest limb and say that that is EDM, based on your name. Um, but yeah. So yes. So yes. Lore in 7th edition. Yeah. And I, I've told you this one before. Um, one of the things I would have accepted better than what we actually got was if they had actually better explained where we got the Primaris Project. If, yeah. um, because this is not the first time we've actually seen Marines like this before. Uh, we had them before with the Raptor Project and uh, yeah, sub, sub genre of, of dub stuff. Yes, sir. Okay. Gotcha. Cool. So, uh, but yeah, uh, but yeah, cool. we, we, people for often tend to forget that we've actually experimented with Marines before and actually had these large Marines, and that was when Korax ex was given permission by the Emperor to uh, to work on the Gene Seed. He was given the information, and literally the Emperor just looked at him, downloaded the information straight into Korax's brain, and said. Here you go, and Korax tinkered with it and the, and actually perfected it a little bit better. So I was like, oh, okay, well I see what you did here, mm -hmm. and uh, and he made these bigger, badder, more impressive machines, the, er, m machines, right. m marines, <laughs> uh, well, they're kind of machines too, yeah, but yeah, um, he made they made these big, you know, the, these bigger, badder marines who were called Raptors, and uh, at first. It was working quite well, and then the Alpha Legion showed up and basically uh, threw a monkey wrench into things, very literally and figuratively, in the form of a chaos plague, uh, ah. and uh, and corrupted all the Raptors that were made, and any and they he they made off with the um, with the data that was used to make these new Marines, uh, which is. Interesting to me because that means that uh, in all this time, they never gave that oh, wait, data. Galileo. Okay, good, he did. Sorry. They and all that uh, time, they never gave that uh, information to. Um, shoot, what's his name? I just had his name on the tip of my tongue. Uh, Baby Spile. Ah. They never gave the information to Baby Spile. Otherwise, we would have seen chaos versions of these Primaris long before now. Uh, we would have had more raptors or more things like the raptors, which would have been a lot more interesting. But yeah, which is what I, I really is that is that canon? I'm sorry, is that um, I, I realize that that is canon, but is that something that's been really like stated to be as being really closely related to um, to the Primaris project? Like a they've really never close said that the two, they never said the two were related. But again, that's your observation. It's it's an, not just my observation. A few people well have, ma done. have made it, but uh, but yeah, people have pointed. I, I remember. I remember back when I first heard about the primary variants, and I was, I was okay with them because again, I was, I kept thinking, oh, they're just an offshoot of the Raptor program, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Gilliman just basically had the same thing done to him, and it, when he basically, because I the Gathering Storm had happened, I knew he was back, and I knew he had spent some time in the Emperor's chamber, so I figured, oh, okay, well, if he basically got the same information that uh, that Korax got. You know, just basically psychically downloads the information from his father. Then, yeah, I can totally buy that these he would make these new marines. That you know, it's like, hey, we need we need better marines. I, I remember that Korax had these raptors. Mm -hmm. I know something went wrong, but we, you know, I'm willing to take the gamble at the moment because they were, despite the fact that they that something went wrong, they were mm -hmm. still rather effective. So please give me the information so I can go and make more marines. That's kind of what I thought was going to happen, and that's why I was kind of okay with the whole um, Primaris project when it was first revealed. Then when I actually heard the backstory that they were going with, I was like, that makes no sense. No. Yeah. That's well done. Um, I you, you were the one who, who told me about the Raptors, um, and um, I think through this story. I, um, but yeah, no, that's, that's super cool. Um, and it would have been a much cleaner and more satisfying and just more sensical rollout than what it is they actually did. Yeah. I like our friend's Ethan explanation as well, which is these are the new Thunder Warriors. 
But you know what? I kind of buy that, especially because the new yeah. kind of Fracti or one of the new Terminators, basically, uh, they actually kill the Marines that are inside them. The old, ter- ter- the old, um, not the Terminator, the, the Dreadnought, the new Dreadnought that they, uh, that the actually, Redemptor. yeah, the Redemptor Dreadnought actually kills the Marines inside it, actually burns them alive. And they can only use it for a so- certain amount of time before the actual the machine actually consumes their spirit and their bodies and kills them. Unlike the previous version, where it's a lot more stable, it, so the new system essentially runs hotter. Mm-hmm. So um, it makes a lot more sense because yeah, if you were running the new Thunder, if this is the new Thunder Wars, then yeah, I would have bought that a mm-hmm. lot quicker than I would have bought. You know, special snowflake marines, as Arch <laughs> likes to refer refer to them. <laughs> so, well, well done, Arch. Yeah. yeah. So it it really does just doesn't work. Uh, and also on the tabletop, I really just don't like how they play. They, I I know you're giving me that look. But no, no, no. I um I'm just mar- making my own funny faces. No, and that's not at you. It's it's at the Primaris Marines, just because um my theory when they first came out. Um, I was I was working at at um, Nightwear, the friendly lo- uh, uh, John and I's friendly local game store, um, and someone made a point um, playing the 40k RPG, um, uh, Dark Heresy, that um, these Space Marine characters in either game or in any permutation or, or in any 40k game are nowhere near as close to what they would be as powerful as they would be um, that you read about in the lore because it's not possible because you know what you've heard about the lore they really are like s- really minor demigods all of them demigods mm-hmm. of war is true so when the primaris marines first came out i was like i think th- i think that games workshop is inching inching the space marines to being closer to what they're supposed to be in lore um you know like that 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 was my whole thought process was that um my my, my whole thought was that when you read primaris marines you should read it as proper marines you know, um, and I thought that they were maybe even like phasing them out, but they're really not. And John and I were having this discussion, you know, um, last night, as a matter of fact, which is, um, y- can you play the primary Marines by themselves, or are they just support? I mean, like, what, ha- what is, what's their niche, or do they, or are they just expensive Marines? They, they really are just kind of expensive Marines. Um, right now, they lack a lot of the support that the uh, the regular marines get from their vehicles uh just having a land raider is a great boon to a space marine player or having a even a something as simple as a rhino yeah is a great boon and you know you have all of those things for for a regular space marines you have the rhino you have drop pods mm-hmm. you have the um the land speeders you have all these other little you have bikes yeah. Heck, just the Having bikes, having lots of different options to play these Marines with makes them a lot more versatile a force. And a these prime fun too. Yeah, and these Primaris Marines not only don't have that, but they're also incompatible with all the other things. You cannot put Primaris Marines in a Land Raider. Which makes no <laughs> sense to me. No. I mean it's like what? So so what? Let them stoop. <laughs> Yeah, the, the they can. I, I've seen they Primaris can duck. Yeah, you can't exactly. have yeah. them just go down in the. All right, we're, we're going to be a little uncomfortable. We can only right. get half a squad in here because of our bigger armor and the fact that we have to duck to get in here. But we'll get to the battlefield safe and sound, and then we can charge out and kick some ass. Yeah, it's just it's just you can't pull it off with this equipment. Sorry. Yeah, just can't do it with no. with. with uh, you know, what what's going on? Is is the uh, the land raider just the the machine spirit saying you don't look quite right? Get out of here! Refuses to open the door yeah. for them. Yeah, that's so the funny. retina scanner at the wrong height. <laughs> <laughs> you must be this tall to ride. You must be this tall. <laughs> Sorry, pal. Here's yeah. a question that that just came to mind though. Do you think that they'll change that with chapter proof? I don't think chapter approve is going to solve that particular issue. No, me neither. Um, the uh, beca- because there have been no new models announced. Uh, that means that for uh, as far as the Primaris are concerned, the only vehicle that can carry them is the Repulsor tank, and there was a new vehicle that was released on Forge World recently, which we thought might be a transport, but turns out it's just a heavy tank. So it's a great. I don't recall. Oh, I know what you're talking but about. But it, it's, it's, it's this giant sort of 
boat looking yeah. thing. It, lo- it looks like a, a repulsor version of a Bane blade, essentially, yep. with bigger guns. Yeah. And that's essentially all it is. It's just a floating Bane blade. Uh, it's got a few, a sl- slightly fewer guns, but they are the guns are a little bit bigger, and they are designed for the primaries yeah, to, really to use. Um, it's designed for the primaries to use, but it is not a transport, which. If you ask me, hell, just giving like a handhold for those Primaris to ride in on, like the like they used to in World War II, where the guys would literally just hop just on the bank of the tank yeah. and just pile on, and when they got close to the battlefield, they'd, they'd jump, jump off. Why can't you do something similar with that giant ass tank? And yet, no, they don't let it. They don't let you do that. It's not we in the rules. We can't off with that equipment. We can't. We can make hover tanks. We can't make handles. We don't even have to make handles. We handles. We know for a fact that Space Marines have magnetic boots. <laughs> we know this. Oh, it happened so in the attack on Rune's world. They actually use that particular fact because it's like uh we're being attack- attacked by a thousand orcs right now and there's only a few hundred of us we're in kind of serious trouble let's fire the engines of this thing that we're on and it'll tilt we just magnetize our boots and our the orcs don't have anything so they'll just fall straight off and we can just shoot at our leisure yeah. and it worked for about five minutes which is all it really needed because after that then they basically Got rescued, but uh, that's neither here nor there. Mm-hmm. But we know that they have magnetic boots, but they just have ru- they don't have any kind of rule or anything that allows the Marines to stand on a vehicle and let the vehicle move for them. Mm-hmm. It, that would have been a, a much nicer option to have, but we don't have those rules. And as far as I know, we can't do that in game, which is again for stupid for the mar- for these Marines, the lack of mo- for. The thing that's really killing the new primary Marines is a lack of mobility. Yep. Um, if you have, I mean, sure, you can drop some of them in, and I'm, by some of them, I mean the the interceptor Marines. I know that's not their name, but I'm calling them that because, quite frankly, I can't bother to be to speak the pseudo Latin High Gothic that is the actual proper name. They're they're interceptor Marines, and that's all they are. Um, so the interceptor versions of the primary really feel about. It. Don't I? I don't think I'd be allowed to say that on this podcast. <laughs> Probably no. <laughs> uh, I've already said ass way too many times than I should no. have. But uh, don't worry about ass. It's not one of not one of George Carlin's. This is true, answer. but yeah. I, but I will I will definitely be crossing some of those words if. Uh, well, thank you for holding back. Then. If I have to actually state how I actually feel about these prime minister but anyways, uh, they suffer from a distinct lack of mobility, though, because yeah. only the interceptors can actually drop in wherever they want to. The the uh, the one chapter who has actually helped in that regard is the Raven Guard, because the Raven Guard have this ability where you literally just pay a few command points and you can just have them show up anywhere on the battlefield, which That's is terrifying. direly needed. It's terrifying to anybody who plays them. I, I played them against him the other day, and he just didn't realize what I was doing. When I, I said, oh, I'm putting these guys in reserve. Put these guys in reserve. Put these guys in reserve. And he's like, he's going about his business, setting up everything. Finally, when I finally placed my guys in the board at the start, he just kind of went, yeah. you did what now? The negative space between my models was filled with hell blasters, two squads of them, a captain and an ancient, buffing them. And I, my entire army went into dropping those two squads he, and those two characters supporting them. And I almost brought in my because I was playing, um, I played Garden. I was playing Militarum Tempestus, so I, I get, I get to, I get to draft whoever I want. They have the, they have the, um, you know, paratrooper special or whatever they call it. Um, and I was, I, I was just like, I think I want to bring in like the second half of my infantry just mm-hmm. to take care of that. Yeah, a it, good round of shooting. Yeah, no, he didn't have to. He he dropped all of his, um, he dropped all of his uh, basilisks on me. So I I took three and a master of ordnance. Yeah, two, he, two he, masters of ordnance. He had three two three basilisks, two master of ordnance, six Lehman Russ. Uh, tanks, including uh, mm-hmm. Punishers and Vanquishers, yep. and uh, he dropped all of that into my squad, and and also a couple of Chimeras with the guys inside. Yeah, with stormtroopers inside. In order, yeah. in order to kill my squads of Hell Blasters. Yeah. And then once he basically got to the point where they were going to die from morale the next turn, because I was, and I yeah. used all my command points. Cause That's I, a relief. 
That was such relief. That's a very cool dynamic, which is you really whittle a squad, a squad down, and you're just like, okay, I think I don't have to kill them to a man in order to beat them. Which, you know, they intentionally... The opposite of that is how... Um, of that, that feeling that you get when you are whittling down a unit um, was was the case for every other edition of this game, which is just, no, you have to come to the man. Um, which um, So that's a big departure. It's literally, you know, a, a reverse. But I think it feels a lot better. Um, and it's the only war game that I've ever played that has that feeling, which is just like, okay, they're so diminished that, you know, they're basically dead, and the game's going to, you know, mechanically account for that by actually having them reduce their numbers. Um, um, I'm sorry, um, you roll to see if they're going to um, um, be destroyed outright. Uh, once you start inflicting casualties, really moves the game along. It's fascinating. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah it's quite. Uh, uh, they've done a lot. I mean, the way the game plays now, I actually do rather enjoy a lot, except for the slight fact that everybody now wound everything, which used to be. I'm a, I'm a Necron player, always have been, <laughs> always will be. And this is the, a Tomb King. The, the fact of the matter this is a Tomb King. The fact of the matter is, my guys were used to be the only guys on the on the block who whose basic infantry could fell a vehicle. And now your standard guy with the last gun. Guard player. I lost so many. I had so that. many so many little entropic striking little scarabs that just had tanks just like just 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 sink just in time with them being eaten. Just Yeah, it like used to it used tune. to be something out of Looney Tunes, yeah. Oh yeah. But uh not not so much anymore. Um yeah. but the um where were we from? Oh yeah. Oh um. You yeah. So the, the whole the whole mobility thing. Uh, to to get back to where we were starting. Uh, the the thing about if you're not playing Raven Guard, however, you really have to just weather that kind of firepower. If it wasn't for the fact that I and again, it took all of that firepower just to kill one squad. Yeah. Of, of uh, well, you know, the just hell blasters. one squad of hell blasters, which uh. Granted, was helped out by two things in the Raven Wing tactics. One was the fact that I showed up right behind him, and he suddenly had to do, just turn around and fire everything at me. My decisions are easy to make now. I need to kill them. And and, and that's and uh, to give you some context, I had two Titans, uh, two Night yeah. Titans, in front of his army too. And I was, fine and he just kind of was like, "Okay, no, yeah. we're killing those guys first because this is a bigger problem." And I thought Which is about it. Correct. Yeah. No. Absolutely. And I thought about you know I was just like I need to drop one of those knights in this first half of the game, and I don't think I can do it focusing on the hell blasters. But every every unit, every unit I shot with, I was just like I think I'm gonna redirect everything. I think I have to redirect everything. Yes. Yeah. To and nope. I, the hell blasters. It, everything. I just every single time I went back to destroy the hell blasters. And and the and the main reason why it took up all that firepower was because of the second thing of the raven guards was which is. Uh, they strike from the shadows, which means that they can Bull they crap. they drop everything because I was because they were positioned far enough away from everything that he had that he had to subtract one from everything that he was shooting at. So all of he had to subtract from one from all of his to hit yeah. rolls, which vastly improved my unit you know, survivability. But unless you're not playing, but unless you're playing something, unless you're playing Raven Guard. You don't have that. Mm -hmm. You don't have, I mean, the Imperial Fists, what do they do? Oh, they give you a bonus. They basically help you ignore cover. It doesn't mm -hmm. help you against Iron Columns. Uh, if you're playing um, the uh, the Black Templars, okay, Nine Templars are really good to throw against units with a lot of psychers, but they don't have the mobility. And if you're playing against something like Eldar, who are masters of fire and maneuver even with mm -hmm. their psychers i was gonna say that that's a fascinating measure that's, that's something i haven't seen in person but i always wanted to it was dark eldar i'm sorry eldar and black templars yeah i mean you could see the eldar are masters of fire and maneuver including with their psychers so the you could have a black templar descended chapter of of primaris and all they're gonna do is run after them <laughs> And hope that their shots land, which mm -hmm. they won't, yeah. while they get just basically shot to hell, and they have no way of base of making a pincer or forcing the Eldar into a corner, not without significant reinforcements from something else. Mm -hmm. So the primaries on their own just don't have it. Uh, they need something like a drop pod, yeah. or uh, or 
or some kind of vehicle right. other than just the one tank that can get them across the battlefield <sighs> totally. to where they can so to basically open up a battle on two fronts. Right. Otherwise you're trying to basically basically form a line and push your opponent into a corner. Mm -hmm. Which granted can be done if you have a substantial enough group of marines and you have apothecaries with you to make sure that your guys stay alive but other than that um, the only unit who could really just kind of show up and harass the other guys are reavers and that's yeah. one unit and while they're not bad no you can't rely on that one unit to really sort of sell your you sell know, the Primaris. Sell the Primaris, yeah. They do seem like a great support unit if you're playing any other chapter Marines. Though. No, they are a great support unit because they can drop in everywhere. They ignore pretty much ver the vertical distance of terrain because they have grappling hooks. So they literally just go zip line over whatever. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They just zip line over everything and just. Yeah. I've never played against them in person. So. Yeah, I, I don't have any yet. So um, I'm. Good man. Yet. I say yet, but I. Uh, I had always planned on buying them, but now I'm kind of reconsidering that decision. But, um, but yeah, the Primaris really need more maneuverability. That's, that's without that maneuverability aspect or some kind of me, fire and maneuver support, uh, like some core, if uh, they need like an airborne wing or, you know, yeah. so if you get some, some Sky Ravens or, or Storm Talons to back them up, they'll they'll have what they need to really continue but they're as sort of a standalone thing the primaris only stuff doesn't stand up on its own yet yeah um I, it's interesting you use the word yet though which is why i ask about like will chapter approve solve some of the stuff and stuff like uh, that the chapter approved um, stuff so far doesn't have any mention of anything that could help them right i'm sure down the line because they they're doing the whole new practice of releasing um the new data cards with the models now, mm -hmm. they'll when they finally come out with uh, with the Primaris version of a drop pod or uh, some form of teleportation beacon that you mm -hmm. can like lob down and suddenly drop in the Primaris version of Terminators, whatever that might be. That's gonna be cool. that that'll actually change the name. Oh. I can give give you the option of really opening up the battlefield because Terminators will if you have a a way of dropping in or infiltrating in a bunch of primaris with a beacon of some sort that can actually drop in a heavy support unit mm -hmm. like like terminators who can weather the firepower and really provide a second avenue to give the that sort of pincer action that the primaris actually need mm -hmm. then yes possibly Other than that or you just have to go and buy some of the older tanks like you know the the whirlwinds the yeah. uh, the um Punishers and all the other kind of tanks, and just you know, bring in you know some Lehman Rust tanks and use those to give you the armored backup that you need. Right, right. Now, or do what I do and run some uh, some Imperial Knights to go with them. Yeah. Um, do you believe that this is just naked game balancing? Like it's just like if the Primaris had those transports, they'd be too good. I don't think that's naked game balancing. Okay. Um. Because I mean, the other Marines have them, and again, you could you could balance the you can balance it really easily by limiting transport capacity. I mean, you could. That's uh, a great point. They count for five. Yeah, like, like if you if if you just want to have okay, a Primaris. That, that's a great argument. Wow, I thought about this a lot and didn't then overthought it. I missed that really simple suggestion. Yeah, well if, done. If you just want to say, okay, well, we're we're retrofitting some of the older draft pods because that's what our you know, uh, let's face it. Primaris Marines are bigger. Mm -hmm. We we've established that, so they're going to be need custom some sort of custom system to get them in. Unfortunately, retrofitting all of the battle fleets to have launchers that can fire a drop pod that's big enough to carry a full squad of ten Primaris might be a bit of a problem. So okay, we strip it down. We make this the harnesses a little different and uh, just have a squad of five drop in, mm -hmm. and with the combat specialist or the sorry the combat squads rule you say okay well it's one squad they're divided into two drop pods we can do that and they just drop into different places and fight and fine we do that so if you just even you don't even have to release a new model you just have to say 
we're changing the rule for the draw pods so that you can now put Primaris in there, and you can, but you can only have a squad of five. Okay, done. Yeah. I can put five Hellblasters in there, or I could put five yeah. Tactical Marines or five Reavers or five whatever sure. and just drop them in there and have the mobility that these guys need to be able to get to, to the weird places in the battlefield. Excuse me. Um, weird places. Yeah, I mean, you. But no, no, your point's well taken. The the yeah. the point the point is, is you, if you if it's a, purely a matter of we're afraid of putting Primaris in different pl parts of the battlefield, well, for one thing, that that point that argument's also also kind of rendered moot by the fact that the Raven Yard have the ability to do just that by just by expending command points. Mm -hmm. We can already put a whole squad of ten anywhere we want on the battlefield just by expending one command point. Yeah. That was scary. John was such a gentleman too, and explained everything he was doing, and not—I not, mean, sorry, everything in his list—and went as far as to explain, without being, without giving it away, what he was doing by telling me about what his, you know, chapter bonuses were and stuff like that, and some of his stratagems. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, I, you know, I can't put that in context. Never played Raven Guard. Never played against him. He's basically telling me what he was going to do. It was scary good having that much. Yeah, Primaris show up. I'm a little proud of, the, of that maneuver. You should be really proud of that maneuver. Uh, no, I rolled exceptionally well. You rolled exceptionally poorly. Mm -hmm. um, but it was a great strategy. Yeah, it was. It was, yeah. A, was a great strategy. Would have worked better if I had the proper. Because I was uh, uh, the problem was is I was a little underpowered. Uh, I had miss. Right. I had misdone uh, my list, so I actually didn't have the enough command points to do exactly what I was trying to do. So by getting the uh, the strat the, getting the strategy off that I attempted to to, to, to do. I had enough to implement it, but it basically meant I had no other command points when I was done. So I, I managed to infiltrate them behind his lines, and they would have basically opened up on his basilisk and tr truly wrecked house. But then he sees the initiative, and I had no way of forcing a reroll. Yeah. So I had no uh, no command points left. I had no uh, no way of providing them any backup. I was committed. And when he rolled to, uh, to seize and successfully su seized, it meant that my alpha strike that I that would have really given me the edge in the battle fell apart in instantly, and suddenly uh, the linchpin of my operation dropped. Mm -hmm. So, and I wasn't out of the game just yet uh, because it took his entire his entire army to finish off the one squad. Which over is multiple turns. Over, uh, I didn't put quite the, the entire army into. Once I started whittling him down, um, I didn't put quite the entire army into it um, as the turns progressed. But yeah, no, it was absolutely my entire army for the first. I think he also the second turn, and then most of my army every turn actually, after that. Actually, the second turn was was dedicated to the knight because you you did kill the squad of Hellblasters first turn. Yeah, you you killed most of them enough for them to die in morale, and you actually exactly. got a few shots off with. On the uh, captain, yeah. With some of the other things. So that happened, but um, it was... Uh, then you just let basically left the, the two... Cap the captain and the lieutenant who were there. No, the ancient. It's the captain and the ancient who were left. And they were basically... Because they were so far away, all they could do was essentially run for the rest of the game. And there was one turn I even forgot to move them, so they were not able to actually make the Forget charge on the that. last turn. Mm -hmm. So... Um, C'est la vie, but c'est la guerre. Yeah, c'est la guerre. So, uh, but again, if I didn't have that ta that chapter tactic, which again is only for one chapter, right? Without the ability to get around the battlefield, without the really the ability to really force your opponent to either divide their attention or to uh, put put them in a uh, in a place where they have to make decisions as to where they're going to go. And even just putting a squad out there as a red herring to yeah. give them something to chase after before luring them into a trap or basically just saying, okay, go ahead and shoot at that. I don't care about that. You're wasting firepower on what I don't care about while the main thrust of my army is doing something else. Without the ability, without the ability to move around and really give them the ability to do that, they they're, they're really don't stand, stand that well on their own. Right. So, from right now they need something Definitely. again, either a modification to the drop pod rule, uh, where you can actually get them to 
drop in. That'd be scary. Um, or just maybe there's something we're overlooking. Like we haven't looked too deeply into the psychic abilities. Maybe that's a really accessible thing. You know, because like that's something that the orc psychers got. You know, um, there are no psychic powers, unfortunately, in the Space Marine Codex. Really? So yeah. Even for the librarians? Nope. No, I mean, it tells you. Because if you could just take a couple of librarians every game, that that would do much to ameliorate that. But and also that's an if. That's just that's just m me making an educated guess about how to how to fix this problem. One thing about the Primaris is the new, um, not quite centurions. What are they called? The um, oh, I think you're talking about yeah. the. Uh, I was looking over the stats with with a friend of ours. You know, we weren't playing; we were just oogling the book when it first came out, and we were just like, "Wow, centurions got a lot better. Why would you ever play the other guys?" And the other guys were actually really impressive. Um, they fill the same role as like devastator centurions, um, aggressors. That's what they're called. There we go. Yeah. Um, so that's interesting. I I don't know anyone who who's played one. I've never seen one in person. So that'd be interesting. Oh, so they do actually have. Yeah, I thought so. A Primaris it's librarian would be interesting. They they actually have that. And they released that model a while that's back. That's right. I mean, was it anything interesting? Uh, or is it just like a librarian with better stats? Because I remember that. I feel like I, because I do remember that, but only now that you're saying that, because that would be disappointing. Like it's just a buffer so librarian. Here's the stats in the Primaris librarian. Uh -huh. um, so here's your your standard right librarian. So they happen to be one on top of the other. So just from the stat line alone, so far, the stat line for the Primaris librarian is that you get one extra wound. That's and only one more attack, but that's not what you're using in your library. And one more, yeah, one more attack. So yeah. there's that. Does he? Wow. They both have psychic hoods. They both have, and they shall know no fear. Uh, excuse me. The standard librarian actually has a lot more warrior options. You can take a jump pack. Yeah, the the standard uh, librarian. Can. Yeah, sta sta standard librarian can take a jump pack. Uh, they both can manifest two psychic powers. Yeah, so they're both basically psychic level twos. Yep. And they both know Smite. Smite, yeah. And the s Primaris Librarian doesn't even have access to a special. I um, I was waiting for that Primaris Discipline, but no, they both generate their powers from Librarius Discipline. Yep. Yeah, Librarius Discipline. There's wow. no, there's no different thing. I'm no S longer embarrassed about not remembering the um, Primaris Librarians because I mean, like. Yeah, they 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 cost. If you're playing for a power level, they cost. One power more, which really isn't not worth it. Yeah, because for for less customization and an extra wound and an extra attack, it's not, worth not it. really worth it at all. No. And as far as point costs go, a standard librarian is ninety three points, while a Primaris librarian is ninety three points. So the same price, literally the same price per for the for the two the two models. The only difference is power level and. It's not doesn't make not any difference. It. I, nope. it really doesn't. Um, so let's see. So the first power here for the librarians, you have Veil of Time, which basically lets you reroll charge and advance rolls. Okay, big whoop. Uh, let's see the next second one, Might of Heroes. Is that an aura ability? Uh, so Veil of Time has a warp charge value of 6. If manifested, you pick one uh, death of Sistarnas unit within 18 inches. Until the start of your, your next psychic phase, you can reroll charge rolls and advance rolls for that unit. Okay. And they always fight first in the fight phase. That's something Okay, nice. that's cool. Yeah, because I was like, if that's useless if it's something you cast on one unit at a time. But if it's an aura it, ability, like you walk them out with a bunch of small units, that would be powerful. It's not an R. It's you. It's you, you pick. You pick one, and that, and they suddenly move a bit faster. Mm -hmm. That's really all it is. Uh, second one, Might of Heroes. Uh, adds one. You pick. You pick. A, you pick a unit, and it, it gets plus one to its strength, toughness, mm -hmm. and attacks, which not bad, but that's not bad at all. You know, again, not doesn't give you mobility. No. Second one, psych, or third one, Psychic Scourge. Um, Oh, this is essentially the contest of wills from the older games. Basically, um, you roll uh, 
basically what happens is that you choose a target and then you roll off, and then if the oh, the difference right. the difference that it, between the two numbers causes mortal wounds. I like that. That's cool. So. So yeah, that that was a uh, that was an Eldar power I remember going up against. I think it was called Contest of Wills. Oh. And it was basically it's like yeah, you take the the target takes a leadership test on three d six and yeah, uh, the amount you, the amount over leader or you, once you subtract your leadership you, um, that's, that's how many the, wounds you yeah. took. I came across so many hellaciously good Eldar powers so quickly in Gathering Storm. I was just like, what happens to me? Okay, so. I could not even place the name to that, but I, I do remember that now. That's actually a much simpler way to resolve combat than the actual shooting and fighting. So I think that's interesting. They added a mechanic, and that actually simplifies things. That's ironic. I like that. The next one for is Fury of the Ancients. It's essentially a beam weapon attack. I miss beams, so that's very cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, that's really cool. I thought that uh, Morty, uh, Mortarian, um, he has a beam plasma pistol, and I thought that that would be the only um, reoccurrence of that since the 7th edition. So that's really cool. There's another weapon. Uh, the the planetarium bombardment special rule is also a little bit like that, where you just oh. nominate a you just nominate a point. It's actually not a point. It's not a special rule. It's a it's a stratagem now. Interesting. So you just if you have a chapter master, you you can pay points, the command points for a orbital bombardment, and you just pick a point, and then everything within a certain radius of that point gets hit. Gotcha. Uh. See the next one, number five, is a psychic fortress. Uh, gives you it basically says you pa automatically pass morale tests and it gives you a chance to ignore mortal wounds. And then the last one is Null Zone, which is so. This is actually kind of cool. Uh, Null Zone has a warp charge value of 8. If manifested until the end of your next psychic phase, while they were within 6 inches of the psyker, uh, enemy models cannot take invulnerable saves and must have the results of any psychic tests rounding up. So, that's actually pretty good. That's pretty cool. If you can get within 6 inches of them. Yeah. Which, again, due to lack of mobility, is going to be difficult. It'd be really cool if, because that was my first thought when I found out just like, why do these guys have these, you know, like thinner proportions? Well, uh, when, it, when I first saw the pictures versus actually seeing the models, they're supposed to be much taller. They're supposed to be a foot taller before, it's a foot taller, right? Yeah. Yeah. A foot taller before they put their armor on. Um, yeah. No, I thought for sure, oh, they're going to move seven inches, not six. Yeah. That would be cool. <laughs> but no. they move six inches like every standard Marine. Why? Yep. Mm. You, you're, he's absolutely right. I mean, the the thing of the matter is, you, if you're taller, you're going to have a longer gait. It doesn't matter if you're wearing heavier armor, because quite frankly, the armor moves on its own. The black carapace itself is designed to make sure that that armor moves on its own. You're literally flayed alive so that your armor moves on its own without you thinking about it. So yes, you should be moving and booking it across the battlefield. Hell, a standard, a bog standard marine should outpace a guardsman, and he doesn't. I don't care how much equipment he's carrying. That armor should, by all rights, move 8 inches, and the Primaris should move 10. And that's not yep. what we get. Uh, there's, there's a possibility that in later updates we might uh, actually get updates to change that. If they're going, likely, if, they're, if they're going for the realism, yeah. How likely is a, a stat line change going to be, really? Um, like adding like new units or a modification to a transport. Like, okay, you can take primaries. I see that happening way sooner than I see them changing something right from the stat line. Well, I mean, they've already made changes to some things. Like, the, well, the Necrons had a few typos and mistakes oh, in their stat lines. Right. So. Um, they cool. they corrected that. It's, it is a little different, but I mean, we we got the change uh -huh. relatively quickly. We have already had changes to point costs and values, and there it sounds like they're still balancing the game out, and they're going to continue. And the word is they're con continuing to try and balance the game out. So if they actually do realize that this is a problem, and we have enough people complain about it, they actually might change the stat line, and yeah, they might increase the speed. It's That'd a possibility. Cool. We right. don't know. But it's possible. Uh huh. Annoyingly, what I think is 
most likely is they'll just release more models that will take care of these things. You know, like there will be a transport that's not a repulsor, which is like a land raider for that you know hovers, and it's for Primaris. You know, I could see them releasing some offshoot of the Rhino. You know. Yeah, hover Rhino. That would be awesome. Just something that can cart. Hover Reno. Yeah. Or as most people are going to probably call it, the Rumba. Ah. <laughs> well done. <laughs> but, but yes, uh, something that just floats across the battlefield and drops off a bunch of Primaris Marines. Yeah, I can definitely see that coming out in, pr in future editions. Mm -hmm. um, it would be nice if we released it for Christmas because that'll fill out a lot of people's wish lists right then and there. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, they're giving us Blood Angels oh. and uh, yeah. Dark Angels instead. Something just occurred to me. Sorry to interrupt you, but something just occurred to me. I'm sure there are Forge World models that can do this, but I mean, like, I'm not about to buy into Forge World just to be able to move a Primaris squad. I don't know. Um, I think the Spartan Land Raider might be able to. Uh, the Spartan Pattern Land, Land Raider is actually a vehicle that was big enough to carry two full squads of Space Marines, the regular Space Marines. It's, it actually has a transport capacity of 25. So... I could see uh, that something like that being able to cart around uh, Primaris Marines with very little fuss, but um, I don't know if, if Forge World has released rules for that because uh, I'm not into it either. Yeah. Uh, and they also have the larger pattern of uh, of um, drop pods, so they might be able to, but. They need something in the standard game that Games Workshop itself is actually releasing, not something that right. is a Forge World exclusive. Yeah. So. Here's a question. Do you see, we talked about chaos more than you and I normally talk about chaos, which is you know, the course of the conversation. And you actually said a couple of nice things about chaos. They're the ones that are innovating, but they're insane and out of control. I was like, wow, John actually saying some nice stuff about chaos. That's really cool. Um, so I just thought that was interesting and worth noting. But you don't see them, because I've heard you know lots of comparisons of chaos specialty chapters, you know, like the Death Guard, as being like um, the Chaos Primaris. You don't see them doing something uh, like a much more direct comparison, like some like, you know. I could actually see it happen, mostly because Fabius Bile is still up and around. That's a great point. I mean, if he gets his hands on even one mm -hmm. corpse or piece of a Primaris Marine, he'll have it reverse engineered in an hour. Call it the Omega Legion. Yeah. I like yeah. It. He'll 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 figure something out. Just <sighs> even. He, I mean, he probably doesn't even have to get a piece of them. He just has to know. Hey, they did this. Why didn't I think of that? Seriously, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. And then he'll just go into his labs, pull up some Primar. DNA splice that into the into the bog standard marines that he already makes, and just make uh, even bigger, beefier versions of that. So, and I'm sure and Games Workshop they won't have transports. Yeah, well, they won't need transports because they're warp entities. They'll literally just blink into existence wherever they need to. That'd be cool. So, um, can it? Uh, can I see the Games Workshop releasing those? Absolutely, because they're new models that they can gouge people over. Yep. That's a little cynical, but yes. Yeah. Uh, Games Workshop has given us a lot of reasons to be less cynical, but that's releasing new models to solve game design issues or to design units to either uh, have their own new models or that you have to buy support models, which is literally what we're talking about. Buying transfers to move them around is something they still do. Yeah. I mean, what I could actually see them doing is uh, essentially releasing something. It's basically the new their version of a Primaris is essentially being something the size of an Ogryn, where it would, it would basically be these giant monstrous creature-sized things like that you know it would be basically their answer to not only Primaris Marines but Centurions and other things, mm. and just they would just show up on the battlefield as these giant hulking monstrosities carrying whatever they can get their multiple arms on. <laughs> And just lugging them into battle, and just and because, but because they're so either resource intensive or just so difficult to make, or so tip, difficult to keep stable, or whatever story reason they have to get the game balanced that they need, uh, you'll only be able to get a handful of them onto the ta table. But they'll be a balance to the Primaris. I'm mm -hmm. sure we will get that. We are already getting new models like. Um, 
the the Death Guard are already getting their little uh, bloat fly things that ru- fly around, yeah, and awesome. they have uh, the new lawnmower thing that came out not too long ago as well. Oh, they yeah. also have new. I think ter- that one's even cooler, honestly. They also have new new Terminators and a new uh, model or a new hero unit coming out. So that's they're already heading in that direction. Their chaos is going to get an answer to Primaris Marines. Oh yeah, that is. It's just a question of when. <laughs> I mean, the demons will probably have something that comes out. The thing I'm wondering, uh, that I really do wonder, is are other factions going to get uh, something that will equal a demon Primarch? The Imperials kind of got that because they got Rabuta Gilliman. Oh, yeah. Uh, and they might get, and they're probably going to get Vulcan and, and the Lion eventually. Maybe not in the immediate future, but eventually we're going to get at least one or two more loyalist primarchs right. or some kind of big hero unit, uh, like some named Primaris captains that are going to form sort of the backbone of a new thing that will be able to answer the fact that we're getting demon primarchs walking the world. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we have Magnus, we have Mortari, and we're going to get Fulgrim eventually. Perturabo and uh, Angron. Ang- Angron and uh, what was the other guy? Um, oh, you said Angron. My bad. No, um, I, 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 oh, I, yeah, yeah. You, you said Angron first. I said, yeah. but there's one more guy. Yeah, uh, Lorgar. That's yeah. Eventually, those those guys are eventually going to get them crawl out of the warp and start br- uh, raising hell, and we're going to need someone else to stand up to them who isn't Robu to Gilliman. And uh, so it's either going to have to be some kind of other Primarch or something else. But even so, the other races don't have something like that. I mean, we're going to need... The Eldar kind of have something because they have Ivrain, who is a walking... I mean, let's face it, she's a Mary Sue. I I mean, I hate to use the term... Yeah, because she's she can do everything. Oh, gotcha. Like she, I've been called Mary Sue before, and in this room, and it meant kind of like pushover. So I was, uh, I was well, just like, I would imagine the opposite of that, John. No, uh, now I know what you're saying. She's Ma- like a jack of all trades. Uh, a Mary Sue is actually a literary term. It comes oh. from fan fiction. Cool. Which, um, what a Mary Sue essentially is, it's a it's a character who can essentially do anything, do uh-huh. everything with absolutely no negatives to it it's essentially uh think of it as a sort of self-insert con uh, character for a writer you know? i see so they they can be bad they can be good they're usually bad and they're usually viewed negatively so um a lot of so when usually when you say a character is a mary sue or a gary sue it's is the male equivalent um I like that the it's usually a bad thing because it's basically this is a character who shows up and can do no wrong and has abs- has access to all of these powers and can do you know essentially break the world freely and have no negative consequences come from mm-hmm. it so if rain in a way is ki- kind of pretty kind of is i mean first yeah. of all she's a walking incarnation of death yep. she is literally death incarnate and yet in the 40k universe she's yeah, death incarnate she is literally death incarnate and yet uh, and that's not us, you know, having fun and being fanboys. And you're, you know, like with like the space marine ideology. We are death incarnate. We we mean no. She is literally the avatar. Yeah. She is literally um, the uh, the elder god of death. Essentially latched onto her and is using her as a vessel, as an avatar. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, not exactly an avatar because the avatar of they actually did create another avatar, like something like the avatar of Cain, which is. Uh, this new Death Guard, uh, this Death God's actual avatar, but it's latched onto his reign for basically she was the one who was basically dying in that particular moment, and apparently she was either the closest or just happened to be the only Elder Galaxy wide who happened to be dying at that one particular moment. Mm-hmm. Again, Mary Sue, yeah, shoddy yep. writing. Yep, it really is. It's an artifact. Oh, but yeah. It's a, um, Gary Sue or, or or Mary Sue is usually an indicator of bad writing, and yeah, this kind of uh, oh, screams yeah. of it. Uh, she is the only character who, when confronted with, uh, what's it again? With was it was it Fabius Bile, the guy from A Thousand Sons? 
Oh no, um, Phoebe Isaac Bell's Armin. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. There yeah. we go. When when confronted with with Isaac Armin, who is is that his first name? Isaac? Is it really that they they didn't go for anything fictitious? That's I'm hilarious. Pretty sure his name is Isaac Armin. I could be wrong. That's but so it, funny. I hope that's a reference to something historical, because otherwise, that's like finding Slambo out in the middle of all those really elaborately designed names. That's uh, hilarious. I'm, that, that's apropos of nothing. But man, that's funny. You were saying. But yeah, yeah. She he he shows up, and everyone again. This is a guy who has spent. Ages trying to break into the get into the black library so that he mm-hmm. could undo the rubric and do all this kind of things. He shows up, and sh- her first reaction to him is like, ah, "You." <laughs> Essentially, she literally just brushes him off like he's nothing. It's like, no, this guy is is, is almost an alpha level psyker. Yeah, you know, he's that powerful. He's definitely beta level, if nothing else. Mm-hmm. So he's you know. Within the top few tiers of, of Emperor psychers, Alpha, or is he's he Alpha above Plus? Alpha. alpha Plus. There we go. Yeah. yeah. Just to put that into perspective. Yeah. Yeah. The Emperor is Alpha Plus, and the only other Alpha Plus psyker that we knew of in the past was Sanguinius. That was it. No, no. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Magnus. He was the only other Alpha part. I was going to say Sanguinius yeah. was Alpha was Alpha level. Alpha. The only other Alpha Plus we knew we knew of was was uh, Magnus the Red. He was the only other Alpha Plus ever known really so they i think they've only been ever two alpha plus everyone else is either alpha level beta level gamma level and so on mm-hmm. going, down, going down the scale um and uh and it actually does go down to if you uh it goes down to a certain point and then after that it becomes they become blanks so the, the certain level so an omega level psyker is a blank it's a true blank and they're the most powerful and they're usually killed on site because their powers are so yeah uh, they're so uh, uncontrollable, uncontrollable and, un- unless they're like caught incredibly early mm-hmm. and even then they might just cure- kill them just to be safe but yeah she's facing again this this one essentially new character is facing an alpha or beta level psyker and her just she just dismisses him out of hand mm-hmm then she proceeds to get her ass handed to her, and she resolves this thing by saying, "Hey, Armin, uh, you know your uh, your whole rubric thing." She undoes it in a, in a blink, in a snap, and then throws the guy into the warp. Oh my god, that's annoying. Which, which actually is a great, a slightly great moment that happens after that because instead of continuing the fight, because Isaac needs her. He needs her to undo the the rubric permanently, but the fact that she actually turns one of his marines back into a physical marine in front of him and then throws him into the warp. What does he do? He leaps into the warp after this guy trying to save him. That's awesome. Which is an awesome character moment, I have yeah. to say. That's the cool. Yvain herself was was something I could live without, but yeah. that character moment, you know what? That's I'll cool. take her just for that one moment. Yeah. Because to see, it's like, wow, he literally just abandoned his entire plan Yeah, to save one guy. I did not realize things were that bad with Ivrain. After I started hearing some stuff, I was like, I'll catch up with it later, and it doesn't sound that interesting right now. It's but, man, what is she going to do next? Shake the Emperor awake? Yeah. I, I'm sure it came up in conversation <laughs> at some point. It, God. I mean, she... he um. Gilliman actually uses uh, Eldred Ulfwain as a telephone to talk to Ivrain. That's how that's how ridiculous things have gotten with the El- Eldar. But even so, that's embarrassing. Yeah, but even so, Ivrain is not a is not at least model wise. She is not something that can stand up to a Primarch no. in combat. And the Eldar really don't have anything that can deal with a Primarch level threat. I can say, f- as a Necron player, I can say the Necrons don't have anything that can stand up to a Primarch level threat. Uh, short of... The Void Dragon. Well, I was going to say short of an obelisk if I'm lucky. but uh, And that's a giant F-off building, by the way. Mm-hmm. Which, ha- again, more than likely will just annoy a Primarch before it gets utterly murdered by one the next mm-hmm. turn. So we really have no answer to it game-wise. 
the orcs, unless they rewrite Gazgul's stats to actually be more in line of what he actually currently is, mm -hmm. he might be a contender to face down the Primarch. Mm -hmm. because the guy's been in constant war for ages. He should be the size of a Mack truck at this point. Yeah. And, you know, he should be able to wreck house, and at least he might not be able to kill a Primarch by himself, but he should at least be able to go a couple of rounds with one and st and, and bloody their noses. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, should, they really need to redo his stat lines and give him a new model so that he looks the part of what he is. Definitely. So the orcs have a chance of getting something that where they can be more, uh, have something that can challenge a Primarch. The Tyranids, uh, they could very easily oh, yeah. just just release a new Hive Tyrant or something like that. In fact, that would or a definitely... small Hierophant or something like that. Yeah, just some, you know, so they can release some kind of bio form that could take on something like that. No problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tau. <laughs> yeah, they don't have a chance in hell. <laughs> no. God, I shudder to think about what they would invent. Just a bigger robot. They wouldn't do anything. It's just Taunar. I it's mean... The, the, Taunar-er. I don't know. The, the, Even the, more Taunar. The, the Tau could invent whatever they want. They don't have the capability of facing up against a Primark because they have no idea such a threat even exists. Interesting. Uh, don't forget the that's a great observation are you sure about that the okay the, on the galactic map and i'm happy we have this yeah we had a card in here earlier was it in here might be there it is there it is so on the galactic map here the Tau operate this little region here. That's it. That is the entirety of the Tau Empire. They are expansionists. It, they are expansionists, and you know what? That little. tiny little uh, that, that rotation of my finger probably wasn't necessary. I could probably, probably just put my finger there and cover the entirety of Tau space mm -hmm. because, and and they don't even control not all of that space. They're they frequently go through it. They have lots of planets within that space, but they don't necessarily control every inch of it. So, and yeah, their sphere is getting bigger, but they're also, again, right up against the Sycatrix Maledictum, which means right. they're going to start encountering demons properly, mm -hmm. which um, as until we get the new, uh, the new Tau Codex, we don't know if they've actually even had proper... Uh, large scale encounters with demons. Mm -hmm. I'm sure they have because they're just too close yeah. to not have. But then again, they're also they've they're they don't have exactly that big of presence in the warp, mm -hmm. so the demons could just be ignoring them or not be aware that they're there. I would think that they're they probably know that they're there because the, the ethereals are a thing, and also because it's shown that uh, it's been stated that. Um, the um those who have gone through the Talisera bonding ritual have souls that grow that glow brighter in the warp. So they're usually the prime targets for demons. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been suggested that yes, they do have a warp presence, but I'm sure that the the demons would rather attack humans or Eldar or other things because they just have more of a presence that they can feed off of. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's like saying, okay, you can have something from this buffet over here, or you could just have something from this bowl of raisins. Your choice. <laughs> You're going to have to sp expend the same amount of energy doing either. <laughs> Very few people are going to say, I'll just have the raisins. Indeed. Because, it, because on that buffet table, you know, there's cantaloupe and other fruits and other things for those of you who are vegetarian or vegan or whatever mm -hmm. there are options on that buffet table yeah. whereas being stuck with a bowl of raisins yeah you're just stuck with raisins mm -hmm. small not very filling and more effort than they're worth really mm -hmm. so yeah i've long felt that way about raisins 
So, uh, so the demons, I think, are pretty much going to ignore them unless the Tau actually walk into an active war zone where demons just happen to be running about. They might be that dumb. Yeah, they probably they would be. They might be that dumb. They probably would be. They're not. We have a Tau army as the studio army, and we still make fun of them. We're still not fans. Uh, again, the or John and I is what I mean when I say we. But yeah. the, the the thing I will say about the Tau is that they do learn. Yeah, they're not. St- Stupid. Mm-hmm. They when when uh, when High Fleet uh, Kraken showed up, and they realized that how bad things actually were. They actually just said, "Okay, don't let them hit make planet fall. Mm-hmm. That's priority one. Destroy their ships in space. We're gonna have to figure out some kind of weapon system that can actually deal the." The, vo- the volume of firepower that we need in space to destroy their ships because the, the Tau battle system sh- uh, for their fleets in space is very standoffish. They use long-range, high-precision, high-power weapons. Mm. So they're firing railgun rounds from the system edge in order to pinpoint strike things. Mm. Now, this works well against orcs because all they have to do is break an asteroid in half. Right, right. The trick is, the, with orcs, that there's usually thousands of asteroids, and then, you know... Right, right. It takes a couple of rounds to crack an asteroid in half, especially the, the properly large ones, oh, yeah. where you have to crack through a kilometer and a half of, it is of rock oh, yeah. <laughs> to actually hit them. <laughs> before you for this. Are you uh, okay with that? Yeah. Well, uh, we have another t- uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and that's it. All right. But, yeah. Um... But yeah, the um, the whole uh, their whole shtick about voyage engagements is long distance. They want to shoot you from far away and destroy your ships in orbit. They ne- they're starting to realize the sort of imperial doctrine of basically getting in amongst them and slugging it out would be much better against the Tyranids than it would be against. Uh, other things, and they actually did create a viral agent which was able to kill uh, the um, the the hive ships that that were attacking them. So they 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 have the wherewithal to actually come up with a attack like that, and the willingness to sacrifice what is needed to actually execute that plan. So they have their own ways of dealing with tyranids, but and so they learned. You know, he was like, okay, there's, you know, we actually have to change our tactics rather drastically to deal with something like a Tyranid. They know how to deal with orcs thanks to Farsight. They have, um, they know how to deal with the Imperials now thanks to the fact that they actually fought the Imperials Mm -hmm. twice now. Uh, so, you know, the Damocles Gulf Crusade was the, was their first encounter and the second encounter was, uh, I think more recent. So they kind of know how to deal with appearance and they keep evolving, keep learning. They keep, they say, okay, this worked, this didn't. So, you know, and after the Damocles Gulf campaign happened, they collected a bunch of Imperial tech and just to see what would work, you know, what they could salvage and sort of use, which is what they actually use to help create their new, uh, it's not quite warp drive, but it, it kind of is. Mm. Basically, what their their new ships do, the ship basically sk- it skims through the warp, kind of like a rock on a pond. Interesting. So it, it it briefly dips into the into the warp and comes out at a random place, and it's usually closer to their destination where they would where they would be. So they just basically just go do these small little hops in, mm-hmm. and because of that, they don't need geller fields. So. They're in and out before anything can really do anything, and they don't penetrate deeply into the warp. Mm-hmm. And of course, they're as I mentioned before, their um, psychic silhouettes are a lot smaller than other races, so they don't attract the attention of anything properly bar- leg- large enough to be a threat. And by the time they do, they're already out of the fa- dropping out of the warp. So they're mm-hmm. it's it's helped them ex- increase their expansion because they now have faster than light travel um it's not nearly as it's not nearly the same as a warp capable ship proper warp capable ship so it's not nearly that fast but it's better than nothing and 
but the, the tower aren't really a thing, so I don't think they're going to give anything to challenge a Primarch because, quite frankly, they don't know such a threat exists and they wouldn't come up with something they don't think is a threat yet. They don't, they, if they don't have the sort of foundation of, oh, we need to have something that will combat something on this threat level, they don't know that threat level exists. Um... Beyond that, who else? Do, wh what other factions do we need to talk about? We discussed the Eldar. We the haven't Tau. talked about the Dark Eldar at all mm. because we're frankly not that interested, so we're not that informed about it. Um, there's not been other than there's not much to say about. Yeah, them. there's not much to say about them other than what we've talked about um, with the Eldar as far as Gathering Storm goes. B yeah, because most of what that we've talked about, the most of the news about the Dark Eldar that we've gotten has just been from Gathering Storm. So it's mm -hmm. just. Well, they were there when Yvrain became the new goddess of death. I think I'm just going to start calling her Hela because it's easier. <laughs> Is that her first name? No. Oh, okay. Uh, her, uh, her name is Yvrain something or other, but uh, I'll look it up in a minute. But um, I was making a, a Ragnarok joke there. <laughs> so, But yeah, she she kind of essentially is Hela from, from Thor Ragnarok. If all of you have seen that movie. And she, she shows up in the middle of the dark Eldar territory and suddenly breaks down all the, the walls that were holding up, uh, the warp, which allowed demons to spill into Kalmara. And that's kind of the last we really heard of the dark Eldar. They haven't really done much since. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure they're still doing all kinds of really deviant stuff because oh, that's yeah. what they do. Oh yeah. But they haven't really kind of poked their heads out of Kamara ever since. Yeah. For the army that's been, for the faction that's been labeled as, you know, the, the scariest, most evil there, of all the fates in the grim dark 40 first millennium, it's being taken alive by the Dark Elder. That's the worst thing that could happen to you. They haven't done much in the last several years. So, yeah. The, um... Who else, though? Beyond Harlequins. So the Harlequins are actually doing quite a bit. They're basically working with the uh, Ivrain right now, so they're sort of her eyes and ears. Mm. Um, they're providing sort of an intelligence network for her. Um, apparently, Shia Goroth has her as a big part of their plans, so they help her out quite a bit. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're essentially trying to... Um, their whole shtick has been that they have a um, sort of a master plan to, in the end, essentially trick uh, Slanesh into defeating the other Chaos Gods and mm -hmm. defending the Eldar. Mm -hmm. That's kind of their whole end game. They, they're setting things up in such a way where essentially they're going to make it so that Slanesh him herself is going to voluntarily protect the Eldar from the other Chaos Gods. Mm -hmm. And in the resulting war between the Chaos Gods will destroy the other gods and itself in the process. So, and that's their sort of end game. Gotcha. And Ivarian apparently is part of that, uh, is part of their, their plans. So they're either going to use her as a pawn or as, a, as bait uh, in order to draw she who thirsts out into the open. Uh, I, I think that's... Pr so that's what they've been up to, but as far as specifics, it's kind of hard to pin down what they've been up to. Mm -hmm. um, what else have we yet to mention? Well, there's a lot of Imperial factions which are out there. Most of right. them are just trying to trying to I survive. Grey Knights at all? Um... And uh, the Death Watch. Oh, that's a that's a thing. Um, yeah. The um, Death Watch, and also we. House. Well, yeah, Death, it's Watch, Death Watch, but also we've we've heard um, we've gotten official uh, leaks for new rules and stratagems for the um, the Sisters of Battle. So. How did we not talk about them? Uh, I was going to, but we we kept yeah. we keep sidetracking ourselves and, yeah. and going off on tangents. But yeah. Um, one of the things that was actually re released in the new um, uh, chapter approved book uh, includes um, new stratagems and rules and a relic for uh, for the Sisters of Battle. 
So um, they have actually a fun little uh, rule called martyrdom now. It's a, strat- a new strategy called martyrdom where mm. if a, a model dies, you can spend a command point and immediately enact an act of faith. That's cool. Which is really good. Yeah, for you know? that unit that just died before they get removed, right? Yeah, it's not even a unit. It's a model. Oh. If a model dies, you can immediately spend a command point. I believe it's one, It's either one or two command points. I don't remember which. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's you spend a command point, and suddenly you can immediately enact an act of faith on just the death of, this one mo- of any one model. Which... It's kind of scary because that means that at any p- if you're playing against a competent player who's got extra command points to spare, that means that at any point an active faith can suddenly rear its head and ruin your day. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah, that's, that's really really cool. really cool, and it's something to think about. So, uh, and they also have a new uh, a new power sword which. Uh, has some pretty interesting stats to it. It's just a power. Uh, it's it's a high AP. I believe it's a AP minus three or minus four, with a sh- with a strength of plus two. Excellent. So it basically hit nice. as a strength five or six weapon. Mm-hmm. Uh, with a with a minus three eight, three or four AP and D three damage per per hit, which uh, is pretty. Pretty beast for a one-handed sword. So yeah, yeah. There's that. Uh, there was another rule that was released for, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Um, but yeah, they also released released new uh, stratagems for the Death Watch and a few other Imperial factions. So uh, the rumors of actually getting new stuff for the Imperium might actually be true for once. That's really cool. Uh, of course, I say I they say that take that with a grain of salt, the size of Mount Everest. But yeah, yeah. take that with a mountain of salt because, quite yeah. frankly, they've been saying it for years. Yeah. But uh, as I mentioned before at the beginning of the of our podcast or show, mm-hmm. that was that um, they re- they actually pushed up the release date of, or again, it's, it sounds like they pushed up the release date of Eighth Edition, and it, it suggested that they actually moved a lot of the stuff that they were gonna release. For seventh edition, they pushed that stuff back in order to get eighth edition out the door, and they're going to be releasing it in ear- the early parts of uh, of 2018. Mm-hmm. That's just rumor at this point. Yeah, uh, we know confirmed. What we have confirmed is that demons is the, is going to be the first one of 2018, and the suggestion is we're going to the one after that is going to be. Probably Dark Eldars, the D- Jukari is going to be after that, and Harlequins. And then probably after that, we might get Necrons uh, and uh, and Yanari. And then we'll see. Uh, the Tau Yanari come after. is just Eldar, by yeah. the way. Yeah. The, well, you, because we, well, we have several factions of Eldar. We yeah. have the Craft World Craft Eldar, Worlds. which are the. Which so we have the Craft World Eldar, we have the standard Eldar under your range, which are the Inari. Mm-hmm. We have the Dark Eldar, who are the Jukari. We have the Harlequins. We have the Exodites, which is another faction that we might yet get an actual proper codex for. Interesting. Um, so there are lots. There, there's no united Eldar front. Kind of like there's no real united Imperium front. There's lots of factions within the Imperium. Mm-hmm. So. There's that. Uh, again, we, we're we probably going to get Necrons early next year, so um, I'm hoping for a, uh, a March release, but it's probably not going to come until June. Uh, Tower going to come out probably sooner rather than later. Um, yeah, they're popular. The... Uh, what else? That's really all, all that I have... Hear, that I'm hearing coming down the rumor mill. So, if any new factions are going to be coming out, you can probably expect to see them come July, August next yeah. year. So, if we do get a sister, a proper sisters codex, you'll probably see that in August. Right. Um, whether that's just going to be a codex, and if there are going to be any company models to go along with that, we don't know. Um, odds are no, because Games Workshop is 
always been that way. Mm. Uh, odds are they, that the uh, they're going to do another Imperial Agents books. So it's going to be interesting. Uh, so it's what it's going to be is basically it's going to be the one book that has the uh, the assassins, the Inquisition, and the um, the you know the Death Watch. All of that's going to right, be in right. one book, likely. Even the sisters. Even the sisters. And uh, wouldn't be a bad thing. It wouldn't be a bad thing, but we're not going to get. Oh God, it. we've wanted every every forty k player I've ever met has wanted a proper Sisters of Battle codex since the Witch Hunters back in. Mm. God, third edition. Yeah, considering yeah, that they that they're still the only, uh, pretty much the only set of models out there that are still being sold in metal only. Yeah, with a couple of fine cast exceptions. Yeah, and one of those one of those fine cast exceptions is actually. Uh, the uh, Celestine, Celestine yourself, yeah. yeah, who's been replaced with a you know a high detail plastic model, yeah, and also yeah. according to the lore, she's currently dead, yeah, which doesn't necessarily mean much for him for a saint. No, never. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is not the first time she has been dead. So, just a sticky situation. It's these just kinds of heroes. It's just a moment, yeah. For, uh, it, if if you if you buy into the whole imperial demons theory, that's exactly what she is, and she'll just be back whenever the need, the call for her arises enough to to summon her back from the warp. Mm -hmm. So, she's just a more stable version of demon. Interesting. Uh, I, I probably if you ask me, the way she functions is that essentially it's a form of possession in a way. I think she just takes over the body because that's how her Gemini's work. I see. Um, the in in the if I remember correctly in the lore, uh, she, well, the way she makes her Gemini, she just basically points it to uh, two random uh, sisters of battle and just says, "You guys are my Gemini's now, and you guys come with me." And she gives them the, the war gear, and they act as her Gemini's, which gives them a power boost because they're siphoning it off of Celestine herself. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure Celestine herself is actually a form of possession where basically she takes over the host body of a willing sister and just irrevocably turns that sister into Celestine. Mm. So whoever the sister was uh, probably dies and become, you know, surrenders her soul to uh, to Celestine as she becomes Celestine. she becomes Celestine. Her right. little her body literally morphs to become Celestine's body, mm -hmm. and that's how she's able to be a lot more stable. Is because she actually has a physical body to latch herself onto. Mm -hmm. And there are actually forms of possession that are talked about in the lore where you actually bind a demon host, uh, or bind a demon to a demon host, which basically uh, is locking a demon inside a body. Um, Usually is against the the demon's desire, but when you do that, you essentially turn the body immortal, hmm. and the demon is locked inside it. So they're they're isolated from the warp, but they still are incredibly powerful v vessels as they are latched onto a physical body. Um, however, if the if the body dies, then the demon is free to go back to the warp. Hmm. Um, but it usually requires a lot of ritual and. Again, usually because the demon is unwilling. However, in the case of Celestine, she would be probably be very willing to inhabit this body, and the body would probably be more than willing to have her. So that's kind of my take on the subject. Mm -hmm. Anyways. Interesting. Um, yeah, well, I'm having a great time talking to you, man. Uh, um, yeah, but it is getting kind of late for me. Um, so we are going to... Um, sorry to interrupt you there, John. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, we're going to sign off. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, we missed doing the show. We'll be back. It's going to predominantly be playing games and testing games. But having just this talk show format has given me a thought for um, for another another way to do that. And we're not going to be subtracting anything. We're just going to be adding. But yeah, this just this talk show format has inspired me a little bit. And I'll tell you more about that, and you'll see us roll it out um, next week and in the coming weeks after that. So yeah. I'll see you next Wednesday. And, um, John, thank you as always mm -hmm. for, for being my co-host. Um, and, yeah, thanks, everyone.